So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Wikipedia uh, for iOS 5.0 alpha that we've been working on. I think a lot of people probably heard bits and pieces of it, so you're actively working on it. But um, just to kind of step back for a second, give you a sense of uh, what we're doing with the app, and then show you the actual progress so far. Um, so one thing that we're doing with the app is we are making a lot of significant changes. And I wanted to kind of explain why we're doing that, because obviously that's a thing that embed software practices generally frown upon. So <clears throat> one thing is, uh, just to provide the context, this is our app downloads um, over the last year. Um, as you can see, we basically are in a decline or flat phase. Um, and also, if you compare us compared to other major media sites, um, the app traffic that we get is, is basically you know, orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude lower than what other content sites see. And there's some stats in the footnotes here. I won't go into them. But the question is really not like, should our apps be 10% of our traffic or 15% of our traffic? The fact is our apps are 1% of our traffic. And even if we could double that, that's you know, a pretty significant undertaking and a pretty significant win. So uh, that's kind of the overall context. So again, why do a bunch of things at once? So there's, I think there's three big reasons. One is we just need a step change if we just continue to iterate on the app experience that we have. Sort of re-engaging our audience and rebranding our app is going to be very difficult. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> um, so we want to really make a pretty drastic change. Um, this is the classic, at the top is the classic uh, technology adoption lifecycle graph. And my theory is that we're basically in a maturity or stable or decline phase, as evidenced by the download graph on the previous slide app. There's been an app for about three, four years, and the native app has been around for about a year and a half, two years. So I think we've kind of gotten as much of the initial growth as we can get without doing something pretty big. Um, and then we can take on risk. So the app, uh, the iOS app is the smallest official um, WMF supported platform. It has the smallest number of users. Um, it has no donation risk associated with it because it's not a funnel for donations. Um, so basically, we have the most freedom to try new things and take on some risk. And um, we're going to do that. So what's our goal of the app is basically to release it this quarter, um, an initial version. Um, and overall, the goal of the app is to increase retention. So we basically, I have a theory that people come into the app. We, we have good brand recognition. People do search for stuff. We actually were featured last week, and we got a ton of downloads. The issue is that once people download the app, there's really not good compelling reasons to ever use the app again. Um, they kind of get their Wikipedia needs satisfied through the browser or through Siri, and we're not giving them another compelling reason to use the app specifically for a mass audience. So we're trying to increase our seven-day retention um, to 15%, um, which is seven-day retention is a pretty common metric in the app industry for how sticky your app is. Um, so what are our app aspirations? We want to make it sticky, as I just talked about. So that's increasing retention, giving users to use to come back. We want to make it mobily appish, which basically means looking native look and feel, um, responsive, so having it load quickly and be responsive in the UI, uh, polished and on brand. So Apple users have a pretty high standard in terms of visual look and feel. Um, and the current iOS app uses some uh, app or some visual elements that are not <coughs> in some other parts of Wikipedia. Um, so we want to kind of standardize on, on the shared things that we do have. Privacy friendly, obviously in line with our mission and values. Uh, featureable, so actually I said the app was featured. This isn't about getting Apple to feature us. It's just about the app being the quality that it could be featured. Um, well engineered, obviously a uh, good thing. And accessible. Um, this is partly about accessible to you know, anybody and everybody, but it's also about uh, disability access. So I, the iOS platform is a particularly strong platform for features related to disability. Um, uh, and a lot of tools are given to us by the platform that we don't have to build. So this is a place where we can kind of fill a gap that the mobile web, for example, would have much more difficulty filling. Um, so there's two core stories we're going to both where we're focused on. One is what I call the full lookup. So that's basically when Siri is not enough. So you're not just at, looking for a quick answer to when was Einstein born. You want to read all about Einstein. Um, so it's a reference case. You have a specific target in mind, but you're not just looking to answer a quick question. You're looking to get a fuller picture of that question or of that entity. Um, and that leads us to focus on the article reading experience, so basically making the article presentation and using the readability of the article as good as we can. And the other big case is kind of a stickiness case, which is the wiki wander, wiki lost, whatever you want to call that, basically the, the following a series of interesting things on Wikipedia um, story. Um, and what we're trying to do is basically make it possible to do to, to have that loop and to have that 
that workflow or I don't know story happen across sessions. Um, and so one of the things that does that is feed, saved pages, uh, being able to find your recents and save very quickly in the new interface. It's basically about sort of hooking you into a set of things and keeping you coming back to the app to find new interesting things. Um, so this is part of a longer deck, um, which will be going out probably in the next day or so. I think that's enough of me talking. Oh, <clears throat> just in terms of timeline, real quick, we're, like I said, later this week, we're going to have an announcement about alpha build that was internal that people who are not already on the current development builds can sign up for and give us feedback about. Um, that'll probably last three to four weeks while we refine some of our secondary use cases and stories and kind of polish things up. Well, the public beta that's a maximum of 1,000 users signed up through um, the App Store, um, and that'll last five or six weeks, and the goal is to like, set to release before the end of the quarter. Um, so that's that. Monty, do you want to take over? Okay. And, and one, one second while we do the switch. I'm going to make your microphone active, Monty. Um, Okay. Yeah, for some reason, even though Josh has been set as a presenter, is working, and I'm wondering if that has something to do with this, perhaps. Uh, Hangouts and air can be a little bit tricky. Try. There we go. Testing. <laughs> can, can people hear you? And you want to switch to this one. Okay. Josh? I'm still being presented for some reason. Oh, man. Got a lot of this stuff. <laughs> okay. Let's try this. presenting. Well, okay. Okay. I'll ask folks. Okay, uh, can you guys see Monty's screen on YouTube? <laughs> okay. Best like Michael said, it's actually working now. So I think it has to, the audio is some for some reason pegged to the. The person. So here we go. Okay, cool. I'll do my best to wrap this up because I know we're running a little over. So um, this is the new home screen. Um, can we actually hide the the uh, participants bar because it covers up part of the UI? Uh, it's that button on the. It's this guy. Cool, thanks. So this is the main screen of the app. Um, one of the major, major sort of navigational changes we're moving to a tab. System. So basically, the three uh, most common ways of presenting um, lists of articles are uh, at the bottom is tabs and easily accessible. Um, the main home screen is in a feed uh, format. Um, so, Money, do you want to scroll through and show a few things? So basically, we have random items. We have things that you've read before. We have related items to things that you've read. And one big piece that's missing from this version um, that's in progress right now is <laughs> content from the Today page. Um, so you can see these are presented in a nice, visually compelling way with big images, nice little wiki day descriptions. They're actionable. For right now, it's only save, but eventually we'll have share um, options on here. And you can kind of get an infinitely scrolling list of potentially interesting Wikipedia articles for you. Um, this is all based on the related article API. There's no, like, we're not building a profile of you or doing any complex machine learning. We're just basically asking for related articles to things that you've read or saved. Um, when can you go to the end? Thing. Um, so one of the uh, popular features is nearby, so that's now part of the feed as well. And then we go back up to the top. We'll show random. One of the cool things is for the random card, uh, we implemented a thing where you can basically repoll the random thing. So if you don't like our uh, our rule, I'm sorry, my Czech pronunciation is terrible, but you can hit the sort of a roll the dice um, and get. Continuous, you know, here's another random without having to leave the screen or have a base uh, reload or refresh or anything. Um, so that's the feed, random. Um, one thing that we're doing is using the new built in iOS um, peak pop force touch mechanism that you guys may have read about or if you have a new iOS device have seen to do link preview. So basically, we get this for free. I'm sorry to the Android people who had to build it all from scratch, but not for free. I mean, we had to do some work, but. We have these really nice hardware accelerated transitions between the initial 
presentation, a preview card, and then popping into the <laughs> article. So you basically you can check out an article in a little bit more detail before you go through to the actual click. And you can do it from search results. You can do it from the feed, from any presentation of articles. Um, and then we've updated the article view. Um, as you can see, kind of updated just the, the look and feel a little bit. There's still some refinement um, that we're going to be going through and polishing up, but uh, get a sense of uh, kind of the updates we've made on the article view. Go to the table of contents too, because it looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> And this is awesome, but we should. Really I'm done. Yep, yep. I'm done. I think that was it. If you guys have any questions? So there's going to be an email going out, and I'm happy to ask, talk afterwards. Let's see anything about the five percent. Should move on for. Okay. Looks like Trey's up next. I'm going to do the microphone and speaker shuffle. So just bear with me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. OK, great. Um, so this is a follow-up to some work I did earlier uh, with, with the uh, evaluating the uh, Elasticsearch language detection plugin. <coughs> um, basically, we have a list of about 1,000 uh, queries that didn't get any results in English Wikipedia. and uh, I went in and manually identified the languages involved in those, and then using the Elasticsearch language detection plugin, uh, evaluated uh, the recall and precision and the F, uh, various F measures. Um, I guess there are 775. I see there in the in the table, um, and looked to see you know just exactly how well it was doing. And we noticed a couple of problems with it. In particular, it uh, has a Romanian fetish, for example, at uh, about 38 percent. Eric ran a different test, and about 38 percent of all English Queries were identified as Romanian, uh, which is kind of crazy. Uh, anyway, the, the performance here wasn't great, uh, as you can see in this, this table. Um, hang on, let me switch over. So I'm looking at the actual app. OK. Um, and uh, I was, I'm measuring uh, F0.5, which uh, favors uh, precision over recall, uh, because I think precision is more important here. Because of the, uh, what we want to do with this is if we have a query that's in another language besides English, we want to be able to then search in that particular wiki and see if we can get any results there. Um, one of the things that uh, David noticed was that it behaves better when you give it spaces at the beginning and end. It helps with the, I, I guess it internally uses you know, uh, space and then some characters uh, to detect word boundaries. And it doesn't work just at the beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the, or end of the, the actual string. So here we can see uh, a delta here. Um, again, I've got the uh, FO5 uh, is what I'm concer concerned with uh, most, but we see the highest one here, or each in blue. And you can see the delta on the various tables. It's only a couple of percentage points, but it did actually make a difference. Um, I won't go into this too much because this is also old news. Um, so what I did was I uh, using this, uh, prob using the probability um, and with adding the spaces to the queries, I then went and looked at what would happen if we uh, in instituted uh, thresholds by language. Uh, so for example, with um, Romanian, we'd set the threshold to maximum and basically ignore it when it says Romanian and say, well, you know, it, that's, that's never right. Uh, English is almost always right. Uh, Chinese is very accurate. Uh, it's, um, let's see. French and Italian tend to uh, be overrepresented. A lot more things are identified as French and Italian than actually are. Now, this, so let me, let me show you the results here. Um, and this was maximized, this was optimizing for uh, precision, so the F0.5. And we jumped up uh, from a, an optimal score of, or a best score of around 54% to one of around uh, 81%, almost 82%. Uh, so we have a huge increase in precision at this at this particular threshold, but overall the, the precision increase is, is around 30% for a small decrease in recall. Um, this one one big caveat here is that this is uh, definitely uh, overfitted to the data because it's very expensive to come up with, um, you know, to to spend the time to actually go through and um, manually identify the language of all these queries, especially when you don't know these languages. Um, so this, this is just a proof of concept that this kind of thing could work and that it can make a significant difference in the uh, quality of 
uh, the, the language detection by setting these thresholds by language. Now, if we were going to do this for real, we'd have to annotate a lot more data and then, uh, you know, um, set the thresholds on, on the training data and then, uh, you know, actually ev evaluate how it worked on some validation data. Also, just uh, to see what happened, I went and optimized uh, for recall, because uh, somebody could have a theoretical difference with me and say recall is more important. And we actually did get a, a slight increase. Let me hop back up here real quick. We were looking at 55.8% uh, was our best F2 score before, and now it's 62.6%, which is a, a good improvement. Again, basically what happens is, even though we have a decrease in, in overall recall, the increase in precision it is, is substantial, and that allows us to move farther down uh, to a lower threshold uh, and, and then actually get an overall increase in, in recall uh, because we can go, we can be more aggressive about the threshold that we choose. So that was it. This is my 10% project in the most recent two weeks. And I just wanted to uh, show the team what was going on. Thank you. All right, we're going to give another try here uh, with Yuri. I will do the microphone and speaker shuffle. <coughs> Can you see the screen now? Hello? Hello? Is, good? Is my screen visible? Yes, your screen. Excellent. All right, so very quickly, um, this is a map editing tool available only to admins. It allows us to do really, really crazy things like manipulating data sources on the fly and doing things like regenerating tiles. So just today, Max added points of interest for transportation, and I'm going to regenerate them right now live for you in San Francisco. So let's zoom out a little bit, and we're just going to zoom. Hello. And we're just going to uh, generate it for this block. So I set some parameters here, some magical parameters, and I click there, and I click here. And now let's switch and re refresh the screen. Um, if you look at the jobs uh, where uh, the ba backend rendering system, whenever I'm presenting, everything is so much slower. Uh, all the jobs are completed to regenerate all these tiles. And we can start seeing points of interest around San Francisco. So basically, this tool, oops, let me turn off the screen now. This Mm, this tool will allow us to very, very efficiently experiment with maps, adding various uh, points of interest, to experiment with road styling and whatever else without affecting the users, and then explicitly regenerate just what we need for the users because it's a very, very expensive to regenerate the whole planet every time we experiment with something. That's my little demo. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll switch to the next presenter in just a sec. Hello, everyone. I can, think you, can you hear me and see my screen? Yeah, I think you're good to go. Excellent. Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm Mikhail, and I'm one of the analysts for the Discovery team. And one of the things we're interested in is forecasting user activity uh, with our services. Uh, this is mostly so that we can, uh, you know, see whether uh, reality deviates from expectation. So if we predict something uh, or like a range for a particular um, value or metric, and then we see that hey, this is you know vastly deviating from what we predicted. Let's check out what's going on. Uh, and to to accomplish that, you know, we need to use uh, time series analysis and in particular uh, ARIMA models. Uh, ARIMA models are a very complicated thing. Uh, they have a lot of different parameters, and you need to uh, explore the, the different models. Um, so in order to accomplish that most efficiently, uh, I developed this tool. Uh, this is a Shiny app. Um, it is an uh, explorer for ARIMA models. Uh, right now, we're looking at the zero results rate uh, from our aggregated data sets. And, uh, Right now, it's just using like the the mean of the entire time series to forecast the next values. 
Uh, we can also start playing around and introducing some autoregressive terms and some moving averages. Uh, we can also just have it auto fit and it'll figure out the best possible uh, parameters to use. And then we can save those parameters to a, to a slot and play around some more so we can see what, the, what it does when we change the values here, save it to a different slot, uh, introduce a seasonal component to it. So let's see here, let's change the period to seven days and change that. So there, there are different uh, elements here that allow us to diagnose the, the model. Uh, there's the autocorrelation function, there's the distribution of residuals. Uh, we, we're not seeing autocorrelation uh, here, which is which is good because it, it means our model is uh, working, is like an accurate fit. And we can save that to the third slot. And I, I'm particularly proud of the slot system because it allows you to quickly uh, compare models so when you you know load up from different slots it'll um, update the inputs to reflect the parameters that were used when you saved them and yeah this is going to be uh, I hope this is going to be a very useful tool for us uh, well mostly it's going to be usually a useful tool for me uh, as I develop the forecasting um, stuff uh, but this can actually be used across the entire organization. So uh, Ellery recently, uh, uh, you know, he made an app for looking at page views, and then he had an Arima model in there. Uh, so you could, you know, definitely look at uh, page views and then uh, try to, you know, come up with uh, an even better model than than what he had using the stool. And that's it. Okay. Thanks. Um, Yuri has yielded his time on dynamic graphs to the next presenter. Um, so that will be Dimitri. Uh, just a moment while we switch to you, Dimitri. Hey, so I'm up now? Everyone hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we hear you. All right. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dimitri. I'm the product owner for the Android app. But uh, my demo today is not quite related to the app, which has a lot of new stuff, but that could be saved for the next showcase. I wanted to show something from a 10% pet project of mine. So uh, I got my hands on one of these bad boys, thanks to Adam. This is the uh, Samsung Gear VR which they make in collaboration with Oculus. You take your Samsung device, you plug it into this, and it becomes a VR headset. Um, and it's pretty amazing how nicely it performs. It's not without flaws, but the experience is really immersive. Like, it tracks your movement perfectly, and you really feel like you're in the scene. I think it's a big step forward. So anyway, I just could not resist hacking together something interesting for this. So one of my interests is astronomy, and I thought a really great application for this would be a virtual planetarium app, where you put the device on and you just see a field of stars in front of you. There would be stars, uh, planets, constellations, everything. And because this has really good motion tracking, you could physically turn your head to look at different portions of the sky uh, and you know, see stuff around you that way. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, now, unfortunately, there's no real good way to demo this, aside from actually like being able to look into the headset. But the best I could do for now is I recorded a video screen grab of the display while I was using it earlier. So I'll just play that back for you and walk you through it, OK? Give me a minute here. Well, let me know when you can see that. Uh, yeah, we can see that. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, again, like this really does not do it justice. This is pretty low resolution, and it's in stereo, and it's got the barrel distortion, but I hope you can follow along. So here I am. 
looking into space at the stars in real time. And all of those stars are correctly positioned in the sky. I just downloaded a catalog of stars from NASA. Uh, we got some planets, a select number of nebulas in there, and uh, in the center of the screen you see a little blue selection circle, which you can use to select objects by just gazing at them, turn your head at them. So I'm going to move my gaze over, and there's Pluto. So you see there's a little label that appears above Pluto, and uh, it zooms it in a little bit when you select it. Of course, the sizes of the planets and stuff is a little exaggerated to make it easier to select. There's the Eagle Nebula, that's Lagoon Nebula, Dumbbell Nebula, and so on. So we can also select individual stars and see their names, like that. Move right along over here. There's Neptune, Uranus, and the Moon. Um, but that's far from the best part. So the best part is, let's select an object, and uh, the VR headset has a little trackpad on the side of it that allows you to scroll back and forth and also tap on it. And when we tap on one of the selected objects, we get something like this. We get an info window about the object that you selected that appears in 3D space next to the object. And of course, this info is coming from Wikipedia. Not only is it coming from Wikipedia, it's coming from RESTBASE. It's coming from the content service. So this kind of highlights how simple it was to integrate with this, because this was literally 10, 20 lines of Java code to get that part in there. So we can move along and select any object, tap the button, and read about it. It's, there's the ring nebula. What else do we got? What's that up there? That's Andromeda, another good one. We can go this way. We can see the Orion constellation right there, and we can read about Rigel. And again, it looks way cooler in the first person because the, the info window is like, it appears in 3D in front of the background of stars and so on. So that's basically it. Um, it's a collection of about 10,000 stars so far, but I made it be as extensible as possible we can add any number of additional objects to learn about in this. Uh, now we got all the planets. And uh, with a little bit more polish, this could even be submitted to the Oculus App Store. They have a special app store for VR apps that you can get into. Cool. Not, not sure. how to do it. <laughs> all right, Neil. So I would say if you, thanks Dimitri, that's awesome. If you haven't had a chance to use one of these things, like just go to this Oculus store wherever you, wherever you can use these things and just check it out. It's, it is far better than you would think. Like it's really cool. One of the reasons that the new Samsung phones have such pixel density is for this application. All right, uh, Gergo, I'm not going to unmute you, but I'll make you the presenter. And if someone on the line can confirm that they can hear, um, once we're switched over. Mm -hmm. And I guess actually see his presentation as well. Uh, okay. Black screen right now. No, no. Yeah, let me just uh, share the window. Okay. okay. Do you guys see his video? The screen might be frozen. Uh, does anybody on the line hear us? Okay. 
This doesn't have no maps. Close distance. Okay, now we're going to just troll it. <laughs> okay, do you guys see Gergo's screen? Uh, I don't know if it was even. See it? Okay, now it comes. All right, it's working. Uh, so, <clears throat> hi everyone, I'm Gergo from the Eugene Infrastructure team. Uh, GPG mail is an extension to encrypt email by GPG. Uh, you can speak a little louder. Uh, sorry. Uh, it, GPG mail is an extension to encrypt uh, MediaWiki outgoing email by GPG. Uh, you might have heard this summer that uh, Facebook uh, started offering email encryption, which I think is a good sign that the technology is going mainstream and it's uh, we're just providing it uh, in MediaWiki. So, using it is pretty simple. You go to your preferences, uh, you provide a secret key, a public key, sorry. And uh, after that, if something happens, like uh, someone sends you a message, then uh, it will send you a notification email. Which uh, is going to be encrypted. I'm using a browser extension. so. Uh, something like this. Uh, it's it's currently running on a Alex server. It has some uh, things that need to be ironed out before it can be deployed to uh, Wikipedia, but uh, I'm hoping to get there eventually. Uh, that's the magic. Awesome. Mm. Cool. All right, uh, we have a line called our UI library in HTML slash CSS. Who's claiming that one? Uh, me. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a moment, May. Okay, can everybody see me? Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yep. Cool. So what I'm presenting today is a tool that I've been working on for a few months now in my volunteer time. Um, what it is is basically OGS UI in HTML and CSS. Um, this library is up to date with our efforts in making sure our interface is colorblind friendly. So I'm just going to give you guys a short demo and talk a bit more at the end um, how this came about. So what you're seeing is a complete library of our current icon collection. And next you will see, you know, some f a few layout examples of what you can do and then code snippet if you want to copy and paste. So one thing to note is um, this is built on top this is built on top of Bootstrap and um, with that I also it, it's also turned into a web component so basically all these buttons here are made with like very simple code. Um, behind it is another story behind it. It could be a longer uh, line of code but basically you see um, explanation here on like how to change the button color, um, the sizes, and if you want to add an, add an icon, how how you will go about doing it. So you see here, if you want to play with it, go to JSVIDDLE. So like here it says, if you want to change the button type to like primary, for example, you change to primary. So button type, 
Okay, it chose to not work now. So it's that easy, and uh, I want this to be large. So we have buttons, drop downs, you know, things that we have in OHS UI, and more actually. Um, I'm going to give an example of how you can start using it if you want to. Okay. So, for example, if let's say you want a navigation bar, just copy the entire HTML. And let's say if you want to use one of these layouts here, I'm just going to copy layout one. And then just open it in my browser and see how it looks like. So, you know, with a few steps, you can actually come up with something. Um, so this, these are cards. I want to show you how easily you can change it. So go into cards. So this is basically one web component. Um, it's just, you know, without a few information, it looks like something else. So for example, this card, without an image, it looks like this. Um, so let me go and see how OK, here. So for example, you want to change the orientation to landscape, for example. Let's go into the code. Uh, OK. And it turns into landscape. So if, let's say, you don't want the title and then it'll just look like that without a title. Let's say you don't want this either. Uh, maybe this. It'll just look like this. And let's say if you don't want an image, how would it look like? It would just look like this. So there's many things you can do with just one web component. Um, so to explain more about why why I chose to do this project. Um, I, had, I had a very good experience working with Pratik um, when I started prototyping HTML and CSS. So usually what I do is exchange screenshots and share my spec. Um, but instead, that one time I chose to send a URL with my prototype, and he basically just copied and pasted my spec into the code that he was implementing. Um, so what happened was that there was no detail missing and it was exactly the way I wanted it. Um, but obviously, back then, I had very, very limited coding experience. Um, and it took a long time for me to learn how to prototype very simple things. So if I had this back then, it would have been much faster and less communication issues. And not to mention, Pratik works from India, so I used to be up at like 3 AM honing in on design details with him. And, but that was in the days when we were exchanging screenshots. So I thought this was an experience worth uh, replicating. This could be a good way to bridge communications with developers. But what is different here that I did is to make sure that the learning curve is not as steep. That's why I use web components. Um, what could be lines and lines of code is shortened for easier and, um, you know, for easier understanding for anyone. So I just want to put this out there, perhaps contribute to more consistency within Wikimedia projects, if and even if it's not using MediaWiki software. So that's it. All right, thank you. I'm going to switch over to John, just a sec. Can everybody see John's screen? And can you hear me? Because I'm quite far from the mic right now. 
Can I take my chair? Yeah. Um, yeah, two really quick demos. Um, so the first one, um, one of the goals for the Read and Web Engineering team this quarter is to build a Read More feature based on the success of this feature in apps. Um, we have like a, a very early like demo of this to show. Um, so right now, it shows up at the bottom of an article. Um, and differently from the apps, editors are currently allowed to define these right now. We have plans to um, use an API when, like, for pages where this hasn't been predefined, but at least this gives an idea of what we're trying to do. Um, nothing too special about that. Uh, the second demo I wanted to give is something I was playing with. So the web team had an offsite last week, um, and I've been meaning to play with the recent changes screen that I think Ori and Timo set up it's many years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, my, my idea was to create a stressful version of Listen to Wikipedia. I, I was kind of envisioning, like, um, in, like, financial institutions when they have, like, big boards of lots of data. Um, so I just have some fun with that. So for instance, here we have um, we have a panel called KPIs, like key performance indicators, with edits to One Direction per hour, um, <laughs> uh, edits to Justin Bieber per hour, um, and also like a, a run in tally of like how many of the edits are coming from bots compared to humans. So right now we have 54.73% machine. Um, so there's like a lot of fun going on there, but also. Um, uh, more relevant to us, I think, is um, I've been thinking a lot about surfacing content based on what our editors are editing. So, for instance, I left this run in um, last week, um, and the top edited article was more in a and it was the Daisy Giant. Uh, and the second most top edited article at that time was the featured article of the day, which was suffering from some serious vandalism. Uh, so, I think there's some really interesting data in here that we should pull out. Um, it's also interesting to see like speedometers for projects. So I created these components, which are uh, edits per, like speedometers are edits per second. Um, and interestingly, Wikidata is usually our fastest quite consistently. So I feel like I'm getting lots of information from playing around with this data. Um, uh, yeah, and in terms of technology, I've been using React to build this, which has been really enlightening and um, I've surprised me up and running super quickly with it. Um, so I'm really impressed with it so far. Um, and it's just been really easy to like, build this. Like, I mean, this whole thing took like two hours maybe to build. Um, so yeah, I, I've got, I'm going to plug in lots of like silly things as I think of them. I have plans to uh, have like a status thing, same whether by what's going on in the Wikipedia's right now is that people mostly talking or people editing uh, based on namespaces um, and bigger aspirations around sentiment analysis on like talk page edits, like whether, people, whether the wiki is friendly or not. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I just thought I'd share this. It's a bit fun. Um, and I know it's interesting. So, you know. All right, cool. End so, demo. <laughs> so like we're, we're technically at time, but I think because Julian is relatively new that we can yield a little more time. Um, so, Julian, I'm going to switch to you in just a sec. Yeah, actually, can you, can you switch to me? Ooh. I'll switch to and Melissa. Then, and then, and then, and then like, within like 30 seconds, switch to Julian. I'll just, I'll just intro the... the ah, okay. okay. I'm, I'm actually already sharing my screen. Where are you? Oh, okay. You can you see it? Yourself. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Second. Who's some dude? Yeah, that's what I was just asking. Yeah. So anyway, so so I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, show. So so I've been working on the documentation uh, about the Wikipedia.org. Portal improvements projects that we are doing. Part of that is, uh, you know, a bunch of A/B tests that we're going to be running this this quarter. Uh, some of the documentation is, is is up here now. I'm still working on the on the on this page. Uh, you know, all my mocks are up here, and so you can like you know like you know read the rationale, why we're doing it, what the initial goals are, what what the first few A/B tests that we're trying to run, what uh, you know the future ideas are, uh, and then you know like like you know leave me comments. Switch to switch to Julian because Julian will be will be showing you guys uh, like the first A/B test 
that we are trying to launch. I think like a lot of you have seen this, but but some of you haven't. So I just wanted to like like show it again. Hey, Julian, you ready? Yes, I am. Share. You got your screen sharing ready? Okay. So. Uh, so this is the portal page of wikipedia.org and uh, so the first A-B test was to make the search input bigger and the search button uh, a lot bigger too because uh, right now uh, actually the language rundown is, is actually bigger than the search input. Can you see your screen, Julia? Uh, can you try sharing it again, like just turn it on and off? Cool, you put your picture on the <laughs> page. Okay. <laughs> Does it the work? The globe is that new barrier. All right, so the, the, search input, the search input is very small, and uh, the language drop-down is actually bigger than the search input. The search button doesn't say uh, much information, and we get the suggestions. So actually, they're, they're working like very bad, uh, especially when we type very fast. And this is a completely separate bug. So the first A-B test is... Um, to make the search input a lot bigger and and the search button a lot more explicit, a lot more prominent. And um, so like when you hit the page, you can see the focus is on the search input. You barely see it um, on the new page. Um, it's, it's a lot more obvious. And um, I, I made the, the search read a lot better. Um, it's not flickering anymore, it's not uh, freezing the browser anymore, and there is the language drop-down over here uh, that supports a little um, search ahead, so you can um, simplify your uh, search with whatever value. And um, this is also responsive, so if you look at the, the mobile version, that would be this way, and if you look at the new mobile version, um, same thing, uh, it's a lot bigger, and you see the, the search rate this way, and uh, the language from them is available as well, um, this. Um, besides that, the page is entirely the same. It's it's really only the that search input, the language shutdown, and the, the the search button that we are testing on on the very first A/B test. Uh, to see if people use the, the search more um, and in a more efficient way. Right, that's it for my little demo. I have about one, one minute. Yeah, thanks, you. Uh, I mean, so, just, so this is like the, the very first A-B test, like a very basic test. Uh, we're going to see like, you know, how it improves uh, you know, you know, our number of searches that, that we have on this page, uh, if it changes any behavior or not, in, in a positive direction. Um, like all the rest of the plans, like as of yet, are on that are on that media wiki page that I've linked on that on the Etherpad. So just just go ahead, take a look at it, and tell me what you guys think. Thanks.